Hi, everyone, and welcome to Gigging Out, a podcast about the people and businesses leading the gig economy. I'm Dana Gagnon, CMO at Every, and I'm excited to kick off season two of the podcast with Jonah Bliss. Jonah has a long background of scaling gig economy companies, including being an early employee at consumer car sharing service Turo. In 2021, he started Curbivore, a community, newsletter, and event company that brings together rideshare delivery and micromobility businesses with tech and government leaders. In this episode, we look back on the major takeaways and news stories of 2022. Jonah offers his predictions for what delivery and rideshare companies can expect in 2023, as well as his advice for anyone thinking of starting a marketplace this year. Enjoy. All right, Jonah, welcome. So thrilled to have you today on Gigging Out. Excited to be here. This is going to be a little bit different of a format than usual. I want to really look back at the year 2022 and have some predictions for 2023. But before we dive into the trends, I would love to just talk about Jonah. (laughs) Walk me through your past experience. Um, You know, you've really developed expertise in the transportation, mobility and gig space. Um, Talk to me a little bit about where that expertise comes from. I'm honored to to be here. And um, yeah, that's that's a big introduction to live up to. But no, I've always kind of, um, you know, found myself drawn to both the gig economy as a sort of industry and then transportation as a uh, sort of, you know, subspecialty. Um, so, you know, many, many years ago, you know, in the, the dark early days of the internet, I was part of the team that patented and launched Turo, uh, the peer to peer car sharing company. So at that time, we, we called it Relay Rides, uh, even. Um, and so, yeah, coming at it really from a kind of um, empowerment angle where it was really meant to be about using existing assets, uh, you know, looking at someone as like, a, how can we put something they already have to work versus putting the person to work? Um, so that the model's kind of, <laughs> a lot of companies are more labor intensive than uh, how we were viewing it back then. Um, and then since then, yeah, I've just sort of continued to, you know, either work for or work with interesting um, gig economy marketplace sort of companies, um, whether sort of like just sharing library models or other transportation, uh, you know, long distance ride sharing kind of companies. So uh, just trying to, you know, put some extra cash in people's pocket and uh, maybe give folks better ways to get around their cities. I'd love to dive into Turo because I think it's super fascinating that you joined, I think even pre-product launch. um, So it was super early days. Can you talk to me about what it was like? I mean, this was 2010, I believe. Um, What was it like being an early employee? You're making me feel old. Um, (laughs) I'm older. Don't worry about it. (laughs) Um, No, I mean, so it it was, we we went live um, a few months after I joined in, you know, kind of mid-2010. And so at that time, this was before Uber existed. Uh, I think technically Airbnb kind of existed in like one or two cities, uh, but in its sort of you know, early form, it really was just sort of a, a backpacking, couch surfing kind of thing where it's like, oh, yeah, there's an open bedroom in Mike's house. Why don't you crash there for 10 bucks? Um, so the idea of you know, the kind of sharing economy was still very uh, unfamiliar on a kind of you know, mass consumer level. And then specifically the idea that you know, a car, which in America is you know, such a cultural expression of the self, uh, for many people, it's the most expensive thing they own. Uh, the idea that you would share this with strangers was, you know, not just unusual, it, it was communist, right? It, it was like people were offended by the very idea sometimes. Um, but, you know, we were sort of strategic in that we launched, um, you know, in, in one neighborhood in, in kind of Cambridge, Massachusetts, so sort of you know, high education profile, uh, you know, kind of progressive open new ideas. Um, already a lot of people that use public transportation or walk, so the car wasn't kind of like core to their identity. Um, and so just, especially for a marketplace like that, it has to be hyper local and match up, not just on distance, but on time, right? You're not going to cross the city to borrow a Prius to go to Costco, right? It needs to be nearby. So start on a kind of neighbor by neighborhood basis, expand out on a, um, kind of, you know, uh, ever expanding radius model. Um, so start in one neighbor, then the adjacent ones. And so eventually, um, you know, covered Metro Boston. From there, we then went to San Francisco because sort of had a similar uh, makeup in terms of educational attainment, uh, transportation usage, income. And of course, that's where all the VCs were. <laughs> uh, so we, so we you know, launched in SF, 
then again, kind of went uh, neighborhood by neighborhood. And then sort of the classic, you know, took a bunch of VC money and they said, grow faster. <laughs> and so then we kind of like, you know, flipped the switch on nationwide, so to speak. Your title was head of growth. What were some of the growth tactics that you used back then to drive demand for the marketplace, maybe supply and demand? And do you think that those tactics apply still today? I, I don't even know what my title was because it was at this, you know, five as a startup. So on one day I could be in charge of growth, the next day I could be in charge of chasing down a lost car, you know, whoever drew the uh, the short straw. Um, but but in terms of yeah, focus, it was really on um, uh, yeah, kind of demand um, and supply, and, and so. Yeah, you have to really be creative uh, with growth in those you know, very early days when you're kind of seeding the marketplace. So from you know, the, the very smallest model, right, some of that's like just kind of like convincing people to do this, right? Like going to farmers markets, going anywhere there's like existing uh, networks you can tap into. So you know, using Craigslist, all these you know, decades old growth hacks that are probably <laughs> you know, tired at this point, but um, finding networks you can tap into it and kind of saying, hey, you're already doing this, this thing's... 10% different, but 25% better. So try this instead and kind of, you know, seeding the wheels with uh, some, some uh, financial incentives. Um, and then, you know, once you kind of create a um, critical scale, I don't know, it, it's such a fun category. It let us get kind of creative with some of our um, advertising. Uh, again, this is also long ago, but we had this really fun campaign um, trying to, I think, play up the, seeming absurdity of, of sharing someone's car at the time right so um we had these uh like bus ads and billboards or it'd be like hey neighbor can i like borrow your toothbrush um and it'd be like someone in like a you know like a bathrobe like brushing their teeth and be like well that's crazy but no but you can borrow my car instead um just trying to like create that kind of mental pivot where like oh well like actually i guess compared to other things like that's not such a wacky idea yeah, something that's that, that's new to them. You have to educate them on on why they would even want to do it. Did you at the time were you viewing it as a comp like you were really competing with like old school car rental because it was pre ride share days or did you kind of at the time see ride share coming? Um, I mean, yeah. So I guess being being in San Francisco at that era, um, it was certainly like a, a fun mix of interesting transportation ideas. I think we were kind of like friends with the the zim ride guys which eventually became lyft um i feel like um i even remember like we'd get emails from people being like hey like i don't know if i'm like comfortable sharing my car but like can i just like drive them around instead um and we we're like that's crazy why would you want to do that so like you know basically people were like in our you know support chat like telling us to create uber or lyft and we we're like oh no that's a weird idea who would do that um, so if we had just, you know, listened to our customers harder, it would have been <laughs> different business. Um, but, but to, to answer your actual question, um, yeah, it, it was, um, at the time, you know, Zipcar was a lot bigger. Um, you had kind of other municipal car share companies, uh, you had car to go still. So there's a lot of sort of traditional, uh, corporate, you know, fleet car share options, uh, which from a demand side are, are pretty similar it's just like it's a car it's near Miami or it's not uh, yeah the price is x or y uh, but obviously doesn't have the kind of you know gig uh, workforce model um so yeah in a way it was meant to kind of complement someone that had a car light lifestyle right it was like maybe maybe you your old car died and instead of buying a new one you would share a car when you needed it and then take the train or bike around for the rest of the time so we really came at it from a kind of uh, green economy, sustainable cities viewpoint. So fast forward, I think a decade or nearly a decade, um, you started a company called Curbivore, uh, which really centers around a great tr event, a trade show. And there's other, I know, local events. You also put out a newsletter. Um, can you tell the audience about Curbivore? What, what are you all about? What led you to starting it? Yeah. So, so Curbivore, you know, our, our kind of central thesis is that commerce has moved to the curb. Um, and so that means a lot of intersecting trends that really got accelerated by the pandemic. Um, so if you think about the curb as you know, either the sidewalk or the kind of parking lane on the other side of that, just, uh, you know, those little slices of asphalt, all of a sudden that's where you're doing you know, outdoor dining. That's where you're doing the pickup and drop off for your food delivery, for your Amazon package, for anything else that's coming, you know, parcel, post. Um, all of a sudden you have, you know, delivery robots crawling down the sidewalk. Um, and then, of course, there's other things that we've seen um, that you know, have kind of just fluctuated. So that's you know, micro mobility, 
your Uber, your Lyft, um, all sorts of kind of gig models. Um, and so, you know, for a long time, companies were sort of throwing things at the wall because we're just like the world was changing. The pandemic was a crazy time for cities and businesses and gig workers. Um, and so we kind of decided to bring everyone together to create a forum where we could exchange best practices, learn from one another, see what works for X, apply that to Y, um, and try to just kind of create a better environment for everyone involved. This is the first episode of Gigging Out of 2023. And before we talk about the year ahead, I would love to just do a little recap with you on 2022. So you put out a Curve of Our newsletter. It always has a great roundup of news stories. Thinking back to the year, what are some of the news stories that really jump out at you as being maybe the most impactful or surprising? Would love your take on that. No, it was, it's, uh, it's been a tumultuous year from just about any measurement, right? Um, and so some of that I think has been good, some of that's been bad, some of it's been mixed. Um, I think, yeah, especially from like a, a gig economy um, viewpoint, one thing that's I think really been uh, unavoidable is the, the rise and fall and the you know, question, you know, rebirth maybe of um, super fast delivery, instant delivery, 15 minute delivery, whatever you want to call it. Um, where, you know, obviously last year or uh, you know, 2021, you know, we sort of saw this boom in this space where all of a sudden there was five different companies you know, occupying every color of the, uh, the color spectrum saying that we want to get you toothpaste in 15 minutes. Now we want to get you, uh, you know, dry pasta in 10 minutes, like uh, just sort of a, a race of speed for, um, you know, grocery and convenience items. Um, and this was, you know, particularly pronounced in Europe, um, in the U S you know, more focused in the, in the Northeast in particular. Um, but yeah, diff- different players kind of made it all over the country too. Um, and you know, at, at curve War 2022, we, we had a lot of the executives come and talk and, um, you know, sort of try and explain the, uh, unit economics of the model. Um, and like a lot of things, it was very dependent on, you know, VC capital to kind of get to scale. And so when the, the market for that softened, a lot of companies that thought they would, you know, made a, a B, C, D, E round of hundreds of millions of dollars to keep kind of plowing into growth, uh, all of a sudden that money wasn't there. And so a lot of them, you know, kind of folded up or merged or uh, retrenched. Um, and so obviously that was a hit to a lot of the, the workers that were uh, employed in those kind of uh, dark warehouses, you know, cramped little convenience stores are all of a sudden instead of selling, you know, two candy bars every 15 minutes, packaging up uh, <laughs> hundreds of orders a minute. Um, so I think from a, um, a labor perspective, that there sounded like particularly um, difficult jobs, whether you're packing or trying to crisscross the city to, uh, you know, get someone their food in <laughs> seconds. Yeah. Do you think there's anything they could have done to prevent kind of the fallout with, with the VC capital drying up? I mean, is there a way to operate that model on a, on a lower cost? I, don't... Um, I mean, I think yeah, the answer, I hope, isn't to, to squeeze workers, right? Like there's at the end of the day, like you need to have a workforce that can do it safely and contentedly and, you know, is, is paid decently and on time and, and all the sort of, you know, pro-humane uh, things you would want. But I think getting to the kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the business model, um, I, I think, you know, one factor will just be, uh, consolidation, right? Like you don't actually need five companies competing to do a commodity, right? It's if I'm trying to get, you know, I forgot eggs and I'm baking something right now. Like I don't really care who brings me the eggs and I don't really care what brand the eggs are. Right? It's just like, I'm, I'm going to pick who's nearby and, and on price. Um, so in that sense, the consolidation I think is going to be healthy for the uh, industry, right? You're not going to just say, Oh, I got $30 free from company X this week. And next week I'll get $50 free from Y. Um, and then I, I think actually getting a little bit more specific about uh, geographies and which SKUs you offer. Um, there's there's one company um, that we also had at the event um, that focuses on college campuses. And so, yeah, that's a really tight geography. It's dense with students. You can kind of think about the layout pretty well. You know, okay, there's like a shortcut between building X and Y we can take. Um, you probably don't need to offer them the entire grocery store of items, just you know, things they might want uh, in the evening when they're uh, having a little fun. So you don't have to have as big of a store and, and go as far to, uh, you know, pack up uh, random items. And so I think that makes it a little bit more sustainable as a business. All right. I'd love to to pick your brain a little bit about um, 
government issues. So you cover a lot about how the government, both at a state and a local level, as well as a national level, um, impacts the gig economy, right? Um, I would love any thoughts around, you know, big takeaways from 2022 about the relationship between the private and the public sectors and what's kind of shifting um, in regards to the gig economy. Policy and regulatory framework is is such a important part of any, uh, you know, business, but especially the gig economy, it's um, almost paramount, right? And, and for a long time, there's this kind of, um, sort of overly startup bro mentality that the problem was all just the yeah, sort of technology and could all just be focused with or fixed with better uh, applications, right? But there's still a, a human layer. And if you make too many people upset, they'll pass different laws and uh, you know, they'll get stopped. So that's a ballot that's really taking place over the last couple of years. You know, there's sort of AB5 and, and the ballot measures and all these sort of things that really started in California, but have now become national conversations. Um, and I think we've continue to even see those reverberate in the sense that there's, um, I think, uh, a, a currently in the works court case about the post AB5 ballot measure, right? So that'll sort of uh, affect how workers are classified in California. Um, so that's kind of a granular example. But I, I think um, big picture zooming out, you know, we've seen all sorts of other uh, use cases, whether it's specific uh, you know, hero pay for grocery workers or uh, minimum wages for you know, food delivery workers. Um, so I think there's been sort of a, a recognition in, in different uh, levels of government about the importance of this workforce, especially as they were so vital during uh, the, the year of the pandemic. And so making sure that they are uh, compensated fairly and you know, sort of given um, the, like the right uh, safety tools and measures to, to make this a, a doable job. Um, and so I think that's just going to continue to be kind of a, a balance, right, between politicians and labor and the uh, companies that sort of run these networks, uh, just trying to uh, find something that works for everyone, right? It's sort of a, a give and a take. And so trying to get everyone to operate under the same rules with kind of predictable but understandable safeguards for uh, workers, I think just continuing down that path is going to be super important. Um, and just, yeah, once there's rules, making sure they're uh, universally enforced and uh, there's no favoritism. And, um, you know, that way, you know, if you're working for company or, you know, digging for company X versus company Y, uh, yeah, it's going to be kind of a fair, similar experience. You, you mentioned specifically worker classification. What's your take on how that that discussion will shake out? Um, gosh, if, if I had a, a crystal ball on that one, I, I could I could probably make some more money. Um <laughs> Uh, it's. I think it's really going to continue to kind of um, be a state by state decision. Um, I, I know there's been sort of uh, rumblings of, of kind of federal um, uh, interpretations being passed down, but but I, I sort of think, especially with a uh, divided Congress, I would be surprised if there was um, a big uh, overhaul at the federal level. Um, so I think it's going to kind of come down on a uh, state by state level and. Uh, kind of depending on the kind of local uh, politics in each state, uh, you, know, you kind of might have a more uh, company-friendly um, uh, interpretation in a, in a Texas or Florida, right? And you might have a more, uh, you know, kind of labor worker-friendly interpretation in um, uh, you know, bluer states. But then I think also, you know, sort of depending on the ballot measure access in a state and uh, just sort of the makeup of uh, the different uh, levers of, of uh, political power. There's, you know, something might seem uh, bluer and you end up with a, you know, kind of quote unquote redder decision or vice versa. So uh, hard, hard to say exactly on the margin how each state's going to fall out. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how the next year plays out in this regard. Do you see that there's value in adding a new worker classification specifically for the gig economy? So it's not, not quite a 1099, not quite a W-2, but somewhere in between? I, I certainly think... Um, the world is a lot different than when we, you know, first wrote these labor laws, you know, almost a hundred years ago, right? Um, there's there's a much blurrier distinction between um, <laughs> just like you know, I'm an employee and I clock in at nine and I, I stamp widgets the widget factory <laughs> and then I go home at five, right? Um, uh, so I, I think even when I've been a you know employee, I've, I've never had such rigid hours myself. Um, so so yeah, I think there's merit to crafting kind of a, a middle ground there. I think it's just like anything else, um, making sure it's not kind of captured by interest as it's being created um, so that it's not 
overly you know beholden to the companies and then it you know hurts the workers or you know if it's uh, you know, too um, you know onerous uh, to the employers that can sort of be difficult from a actual profitability standpoint so I, I think finding a middle ground that's you know helps the workers gives them what they want is you know meaningful protections and pay but at the same time you know recognizes that there are benefits to the gig economy when it's done well and fairly and uh you know sort of ethically and uh kind of striking that balance is uh it's a tough job yeah it's really it's interesting we've done a ton of research um with gig workers a lot of surveys and you know they always report that they want to stay classified as a 1099 they want that flexibility but then when you ask them would they be willing to give up some flexibility for a higher wage or a guaranteed minimum hours or benefits, they always say yes. So it's, it is really a challenging environment. So, you know, hopefully the private and public sectors can come together and come up with a solution that, like you said, works for everybody. Yeah. And there's always status quo bias, right? Like if, if someone's uh, used to something, change is scary. Like you, you don't know if it's going to be better or worse. So it's like, well, this, this works for now. Right. So um, it's kind of hard to just like ask people like, yeah. Imagine a different world. What would that be like? Right. It's, it's a very abstract question. So I, I think that's why there's a role for, you know, kind of thoughtful leadership and, and kind of, uh, you know, proposing policy and showing how it works and, you know, not to get overly into the sort of states as laboratories of democracy, but in a world where, oh, that policy worked in, you know, Minnesota. Why don't we bring it to Milwaukee? Right. Like just sort of uh, uh, <laughs> not, not to pick on the Midwest there, but just, you know, trying different things and, and seeing what works and adapting and um, kind of being responsive to the needs of uh, the economy. Yeah, it seems like that's a, at least last year at Curb of War, that was a, a big topic was sort of bringing government and this, you know, private gig companies together. I mean, do you see them, work, I mean, you probably know better than anyone, are they working closely together to try to solve this? Like, how do you think they could work together better? Yeah, I think... Um, the kind of uh, the bad old days of, of uh, just kind of breaking things and asking for forgiveness afterwards are uh, thankfully, you know, largely behind us. Uh, I'm sure some would, would disagree, but um, I, I think it's, there's been a recognition on, on both sides that it's to work, it needs to be collaborative and you have an open dialogue and, and kind of, um, you know, you can't just <laughs> keep breaking the rules and then think nothing's going to happen. Um, so in that sense, I think that's part of the value of something like Curb Awards, getting the people in the same room so they can sort of share their stories, you know, talk about what they're working on, what, what they see, what they need, um, and you can kind of craft a middle ground. Um, and so I think we've seen that a lot from both the actual, you know, labor participation rules and, and you know, how you, uh, uh, you know, employ and compensate your gig workers. And then I think also from the kind of policy around you know, thinking about the vehicles or where uh, you know food or, or packages are picked up and dropped off um, you know that's sort of an urban framework but also at the end of the day it kind of affects the worker too because if you tell them okay you need to get out of the car and, and pick up the food you know here or there or in the back of the building um, it can you know change how uh, profitable you know an hour of work is it can make things safer or less safe uh, it can also you know, have an impact on the actual you know, restaurateur or retailer that's uh, you know, handing off the goods. So there's just all these second order effects uh, that need to be thought about. I'd love to talk through, you know, some of the some of the verticals that you have expertise in and some of your predictions for the year ahead. Um, let's start start with ride sharing. You know, you cover a lot about ride share. What are some of the changes that you anticipate coming in the year ahead, or maybe some of the trends that might unfold? I think um, you know from from a consumer perspective, right? Uh, ride shares it's it's gotten better over the last you know, six months. I remember, gosh, probably a, a year ago. I think there's a, a quote I gave to the Washington Post where I'm just like talking about you know complaining about having to wait about uh, 30 minutes to go in a two mile uh, Uber or Lyft, um, and it's it's certainly gotten better than that kind of low point. Um, you know, it's sort of as things were opening up post uh, post early waves of the pandemic, right? So I think we've reached a, a better balance uh, in terms of, you know, kind of driver availability. And obviously the, the rates have gone up that, you know, sort of consumers were used to it being super cheap. And a lot of that was, again, kind of like subsidized by VC dollars, or just sort of trying to buy growth for growth's sake. Um, and so in that sense, I think this new equilibrium 
is hopefully a little bit better for everyone, right? It's like uh, hopefully a good amount of that pay is being passed on to the drivers. Um, maybe consumers aren't being quite so superfluous with their <laughs> decisions. You know, you're not going to take an Uber half a mile and you can just walk now, which is, I think, a good decision for everyone. Um, so we've also seen you know, things like uh, Uber Pool and Lyft Line kind of return in a lot of cities, although they've, they've changed the names a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping this new equilibrium is a little bit more sustainable for everyone. What about on the on the business side? Any Anything that you think these companies should be looking out for in the new year? Well, uh, yeah, to, to get the real answers, they're going to have to come to Curve before. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think... Um, it's, it's, I mean, interesting, right? Like it's, they've become very just kind of nuts and bolts operators, right? Like it's, it's no longer super pie in the sky. We've seen Uber, you know, kind of uh, sell off their flying cars division, sell off their uh, self-driving, um, you know, uh, autonomous vehicle division, um, kind of spin out and partner with uh, the scooter uh, operator. Um, and then just really kind of, you know, become like a, can can we make every you know, mile, every package, every you know, burrito profitable kind of business? Um, so uh, and, you know, we've seen the unit economics improve, right? Um, and so I think both from a uh, TNC perspective and from a food delivery perspective, uh, I think getting uh, focused seems to have been working for them, right? As, as the numbers improve. Um, so I think that's that's been sort of the big story at Uber. Lyft has been... Um, I think a little behind their, their delivery product is um, not quite as mature as Uber, um, but they're sort of, I think, belatedly you know, recognizing that and catching up and doing some cool things with their own delivery arm that's, I think, a little different than, than all the other players. So, yeah, I think just making the unit economics work seems to be the, uh, the name of the game in 2023. You mentioned food delivery. Obviously, there's, you know, these huge players, Uber, in, in, this, you know, in the space, but DoorDash. Uh, there's also a ton of small mom and pop delivery companies out there. Um, what challenges do you foresee for them or any advice that you have going into the new year, how they can be more competitive? Um, what would you, what would you say to them? It's, it's so funny because if we sort of like think about how food delivery used to be like back in the day, right? It's like you would call up a restaurant and, you know, they'd say, okay, like, yeah, the, the guy's going to be there 30 minutes later and um, you know, someone would show up on a bike or a, a beat up old uh, station wagon, uh, you know, with, with your Chinese food or your Domino's pizza or something, right? So food delivery has sort of existed pre-appification. Um, a lot of that was done in-house, but there were sort of behind the scenes, you know, some uh, kind of local delivery networks that would handle a lot of those. Um, and so those still exist in, in certain cities where there'll be a, a different player that just, you know, we only do food delivery in LA, we only do it in Chicago, we only do it in Nashville, whatever it is. Um, and so I think a lot of that comes down to their relationships with the restaurateurs, um, showing how they can, by better knowing the, the market and the product and the businesses, they can uh, you know, deliver your food in a faster way or in a way that makes sure that it's not all jumbled and upside down and the customer gets you know, a spilled <laughs> bag of cold French fries. Um, so I think kind of competing on quality works for them. Um, and then sometimes they can even compete on price, right? Because they don't have this sort of huge overhead machine to support. Um, so I think there's definitely room for both. And then I think from a um, local delivery operator perspective, you know, sort of maintaining uh, a happy and healthy workforce and kind of keeping up with new ways to pay them and uh, you know, kind of keep them compliant. Uh, that's where <laughs> great tools like yours come in. I mean, obviously you talk to a lot of gig company owners and founders, but do you, do you hear from the gig worker side of things often? And what are some of the things that they're looking for in the people that they, or the companies that they choose to work for? Yeah. I mean, I like to think that we really come at this from, you know, both sides of the table, uh, no pun intended, right? I mean, sort of my, my partner, Harry, uh, runs a, a very, you know, obviously, you know, labor focused, uh, website, the rideshare guy. And so we're, we're always in communication about, uh, what's bubbling up from the ground. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think from a gig worker perspective, you just have so many options today, right? It's, it's no longer just like, well, I'm going to run Uber and then run Lyft on my app at the same time and you know, just kind of pick one or the other. But if, if, if there's not enough, I'm kind of stuck, right? There's more apps that you can probably fit on your phone these days. Um, so uh, competing for their attention and loyalty 
I think is paramount, right? Because you don't want someone that's only going to do one delivery for you every day and then they're off to another app and they miss your alert. Uh, it just sort of creates all this friction and, and dropped orders and longer wait time. And, and you know, no one wants cold pizza. <laughs> um, so creating an environment that supports workers, you know, makes them want to stay, rewards them for their own loyalty, you know, whether that's kind of bonuses for completing multiple orders or you know, longevity, whatever it is. Um, I think, yeah, you, you got to put the worker first. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think that that's a trend that we'll see is more, more worker centric, you know, policies and programs to, to really compete for that workforce. Um, let's talk about robots. <laughs> um, you mentioned, <laughs> My favorite. you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned food delivery robots. Uh, and I saw several of them at curb of war last year and they were, I mean, they were so much fun to watch, but I mean, I'm in Salt Lake city, Utah. We don't food delivery robots have not made it here yet. I mean, do you see this really playing a role in the future of, of delivery? And if so, you know, how, how do you see this playing out? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, here in LA, uh, we've definitely kind of become the epicenter for delivery robots. Um, both in terms of you know, where companies are headquartered and just where they kind of um, experiment. Um, and I think that kind of makes sense in terms of, um, you know, it doesn't really snow, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, the city is sort of, it's both dense, but has like lots of different districts. So you can kind of um, corral like, okay, like these robots are just delivering things from Melrose or just, you know, around downtown Santa Monica. Um, so I think in that way, there's kind of a sweet spot for robots where they'll work better, right? Um, I don't, I don't think they're gonna make a lot of sense in like a sprawling exurban, uh, you know, environment of you know, two miles between intersections, you know, somewhere deep in the heart of Texas, right? Like that just, <laughs> but the poor robot's not gonna make it there and back. Um, but I think there are certain environments um, where it's you know dense, but not so dense that you know I don't think it would also work in. Uh, Midtown Manhattan, just because there'd be too many you know, feet in the way of the robot. So there's certainly a sweet spot where I can see it working. And then I think as it kind of learns, uh, it can kind of expand out from there. I think, you know, college campuses, corporate campuses, that's another interesting environment. Um, so I, I see this as a kind of interesting, you know, complement, but not supplement from a uh, retailer or restaurateur perspective. Uh, you know, I, I don't think uh, if you have a, a thousand restaurants that you're all of a sudden not going to need any uh, delivery workers, but uh, you might have a, a percentage of those restaurants where you can augment some of that with the robots. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, I think of anything that could also work well in environments that just aren't that great from a uh, you know, worker perspective to, to do a delivery run, right? Because it's a congested street and there's, you don't want to double park or find the alley or uh, you know, wait in line to be the 10th person picking up something. Um, so I'd like to hope that this can be used in a way that kind of makes the system work a little bit better for everyone. Um, what about autonomous vehicles? I mean, do you see them either in the delivery space or in rideshare? Do you really think that they'll, they'll hit a point where they become kind of a serious player in that space in either of those spaces? Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting question because autonomous vehicle means so many things to different people, right? Um, some of the delivery robots are autonomous and other ones are kind of being remotely piloted. Um, and, uh, they don't always want you to know which one it is. Um, <laughs> so I, I think, yeah, on that scale, um, you know, if a AV robot, uh, on the sidewalk, uh, gets confused and it runs over my foot, um, no harm, no foul, right? The, the stakes are a little bit lower than, uh, uh, an AV, uh, minivan. Um, and, and I think again, from a, food perspective, um, smaller makes more sense, right? It doesn't, whether, whether it's a human driving it or a robot driving it, I don't need a, a Chevy Suburban to move a burrito around. Um, so I think in this sense, AV could be complementary, and also it kind of allows for that, okay, maybe it's AV 90%, but when it gets to a confusing intersection, the remote operator kind of tells it, go left, go right. Um, I think that works better than a car hurtling down the highway. Final question. You're talking to someone and they're talk they're saying that they're interested in starting a gig economy company in 2023, maybe tapping into a gig workforce model. What advice would you give them? Uh, I hope I hope you don't like sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think I, I mean, look, uh, as as a, a dork for these things, I, I love marketplaces, right? I, I uh, whether it's purely you know, gig focused or you know some marketplaces are almost you know not even 
labor uh, specific, right? You can just have people trading things on the internet and you know, the, the labor is the user. Um, so I, I think it's a fascinating you know, way to do business because it kind of gets to like the, the heart of uh, hu- human commerce, right? It's just like two people trading by a, a campfire. <laughs> Uh, and that's what a marketplace is. Once you strip away the, uh, you know, the app and the computer and all the fancy stuff, it's just you know humans trading, um, but kind of creating specific use cases that uh, empower the uh, product or service that you've kind of built a vertical around. Um, so I think there's still ample room for you know either new verticals that are focused on something that hasn't really been marketplaceified or gigified yet. I think there's you know ample opportunity to take a lot of the ones that they have uh, incumbents in and uh, you know, either do it better or you know, kind of bring it to a, a new um, geography that doesn't have that service yet. Um, so I think in terms of uh, using the internet to uh, dis- uh, disentangle a lot of things that used to be uh, you know, powered by a brick and mortar middleman, the, the, the path the road is still very long, right? There's, there's still a million marketplaces yet to bloom. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, the like cropping up of B2B marketplaces that I'm starting to see, it's just interesting all the different things that I think you use the term Appify. There's, you think that we have like, an app for everything today, but really there's still- Just you wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just you wait. Like, I mean, the most niche, you know, type of verticals have, have an opportunity here, so. Yeah, I can't, I can't wait, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm ready to try more. Well, Jonah, thank you so much for being here today. I've learned a ton from you. This has been super insightful and really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Every. We work with gig companies, marketplaces, delivery businesses, and more to pay their workers fast. You can learn more at every.com.